and welcome to On The Ledge Podcast. I'm Jane Perrone, your host, and I'm here to help you help your houseplants. If you find maiden hairs maddening, can't make your bird's nest behave, or have a nightmare nephrolepis, I'm here to help. This week's show is all about how to keep ferns, those prima donnas of the indoor plant world. Well, I was going to say how to keep ferns looking good, but for most of us, keeping one alive for more than a few months would actually be an achievement, let alone trying to make them look good. I'll be offering up lots of suggestions for the easiest ferns to grow, considering how to keep ferns happy, even that maddening maiden hair, and talking to someone with the most enormous fern. It's so impressive, I think it really deserves its own Instagram account, to find out the secret of his success. Plus, I'll be answering a question about apothos with splotches. Wow, it's a good job I haven't started on the gin and tonics yet. Yes, a silver pothos that suffered some strange damage is coming up in our question of the week from a listener. Thanks for all your feedback on last week's show about quick wins. It's been great to see that some of you are trying to grow your own Edo's, lemongrass, fenugreek, coriander. I did actually totally forget that I'd bought some ginger root to plant as well for the episode. So that's something else you can do. If you buy a ginger root with some growing points on it, still intact, then you'll be able to grow your own ginger plant On the Edo front, my success rate, well, it's looking 50-50 at the minute. I've had two Edos which have gone spectacularly rotten and stinky already. So that wasn't so good. I think they must have had some damage to the skin, which let in some infection. But the other two have some hopeful bumps that indicate that some roots are forming. So fingers crossed. And my lemongrass, well, that's doing incredibly well. It's got roots galore. So that's really exciting. I will keep you posted as those grow. And just a reminder that I'm after your moth orchid questions for my Phalaenopsis special coming up soon. So if you've got a poorly moth orchid or just a question about how to take better care of your Phalaenopsis, then do drop me a line and let me know what you'd like to ask. I'll have various experts on tap to answer your questions. The indoor fern family is enormous. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of ferns that will happily grow indoors given the right care. From the leathery antlers of the staghorn ferns to the delicate papery leaves of the maidenhair fern, there's something for everyone. And yet EFD, that's short for early fern death, is the number one cause of distress among houseplant growers aged 20 to 45. Okay, I just made that statistic up, admittedly, but I bet there are many of you who can identify that moment when you discover that your precious little lush green specimen has turned crispier than Donald Trump's hairdo. It's kind of hard to generalise given the number of ferns there are out there for indoor growing, but generally the rule with ferns is this, and this is where most people fall down. Constant moisture of the potting soil is key. Whereas most houseplants, I'd say, yeah, if it dries out a bit, that's absolutely fine. Just water again and it should be okay. With ferns, it ain't going to cut the mustard. They like to have their compost continuously moist. So that means that any time that you miss watering for a day or two, particularly with those with thinner, more papery leaves, I'm looking at you, maidenhair fern, you're going to have a problem. So how can you ensure, if like me, you were a bit erratic with the watering can, that your fern doesn't suffer? Well, I'm going to go through a list of ideas here. Some of them will work for you, some of them won't. But take your pick. Number one, try putting your fern in a terrarium. If you have a large terrarium, a fish tank or similar, this is great for things like the maidenhair fern. You can also buy the large glass cloches in places like TK Maxx and other stores, which you can put over the top of a whole plant. And this is a brilliant way to increase the humidity around the plant. And increasing humidity around the 
plant will cut down on the amount of evaporation happening from the potting soil, which will give that constant moisture we've been talking about. Looking at my precious very first copy of The Houseplant Expert by everyone's favourite Dr Hesseon, there's a little idea which I thought would be a great thing to try. Not that I've done it yet, but it involves taking a plastic mesh tube. I guess it's the kind you get wrapped around newly planted trees. Setting that in a tray using plaster of Paris and then covering the base of the tray with pebbles, or I guess you could use expanded clay pebbles like hydraulica, and then pouring compost into the tube and then planting ferns into the mesh. And then over the top goes a large, tall bell jar. And this he calls a fern column. This is a really nice idea. And I searched around the internet to see if I could see pictures of anyone who'd actually tried this. And there was not a picture to be found. But I thought this looked really interesting. So if somebody wants to give this a try, I'd love to see how you get on. Uh, Haseon suggests that this is an attractive adaptation of the Victorian fern case for growing delicate specimens. And he recommends miniature ferns brought, brought from a specialist supplier or collect tiny plants from damp woodland. I wouldn't recommend the latter these days. I think collecting plants in the wild is generally a big no-no unless it's, I don't know, moss on a garage roof as James Wong did recently. But yes, if anyone's given that a try or are going to give that a try, I'd love to see how you get on with it. Sounds like a really cool idea. I'll post a picture of that little panel from the book in my show notes. But assuming you're not going to have time for a project like that quite yet, what can you do in the meantime? Another option is watering spikes. We talked about these back in episode 43 with summer rain oaks, and I've since bought some for myself. And they are a brilliant way of keeping the moisture going steadily to the plant. This way, you'll just have to keep the reservoir into which the watering spikes are connected, topped up, and that's all you need to do. They're basically a ceramic cone with a pipe attached, which you put into a container of water, and the cone goes into the compost, and through the wick effect, the plant stays moist. You'll find these sold as ceramic watering spikes or watering stakes, and they're pretty widely available if you look on the major online retailers. So do check them out. They are definitely worth a try for keeping your ferns happy. One thing that worked for me when it came to making sure my ferns were a little bit happier was potting them on into a slightly larger pot. Now, this is a bit of a balancing act. You don't want to put them into a huge pot where they're going to get waterlogged, but oftentimes tiny plastic pots evaporate water incredibly quickly and you'll find they dry out very quick and need watering almost every day in hot weather as we've been having in the UK recently. If you pot them up into a slightly larger size pot you'll find that you don't have to water quite so often which can be a bonus. When I repotted I added some vermiculite to the mix. Now vermiculite unlike perlite holds water so when you water the vermiculite will suck that water up and slowly release it to the plant so this is a good addition for fern compost if you're making it up yourself if you've got regular house plant compost you can use that and just add your vermiculite Suggestion four, make yourself a little fernery, by which I mean make sure that all your ferns are gathered together in one place, either James Wong style in one container or perhaps just grouped together as a group of pots. This way they'll benefit from the microclimate around the plants. Also, it's helpful to remind you that these plants do need regular watering and when you've got to do that watering, they're all together. I'm also going to try the wick watering technique that Dale Martin suggested for Streptocarpus back in episode 54 involving a plastic tub and some acrylic yarn pushed up into the pot and the two joined together with the pot sitting above the container. I think this will also be an excellent way for watering ferns so I'm going to give that a try. When it comes to reducing evaporation from the compost, one of the best ways of doing this is mulching the top of the pot. So putting something like, well, it could be anything from gravel to pretty stones to glass marbles, anything that's going to stop the water evaporating from the top of the pot will no doubt help and may also reduce the number of fungus gnats laying eggs in your compost although it's not a miracle cure. Listen back to episode 19 for the full skinny on how to get rid of fungus gnats. And talking of evaporation, if you're growing your ferns in terracotta pots, 
Perhaps try switching to plastic pots because although they're more attractive, terracotta pots are porous, which means that they do allow a lot more evaporation to happen from the pot. Therefore, they dry out more quickly, whereas plastic tends to hold the moisture in. After all, you can always hide an ugly plastic pot by just placing an outer cash pot around it. And one final idea for you, and it's called double potting. I don't know why my dirty mind seems to make that sound rather rude. But anyway, it just means sinking your pot into another pot full of compost. This helps to insulate the potting soil in the inner pot from dry air around it and also from changes in temperature. It also helps to keep air humidity higher around the plant. So it serves lots of different purposes. It means the roots are cool and damp, but they're not getting waterlogged either. Just make sure that the outer container is waterproof and that you're a little bit careful with the watering so that you don't get a load of water getting stagnant at the bottom of the outer container. So there you go, a selection of tricks and tips that might work for you. I have to say though that I don't feel like I'm a natural fern grower. I just do struggle with these plants and continue to do so. But it's inspiring when you come across people on social media who have clearly got their fern game sorted. And one of those people is Raphael Delalo. He is Ohio Tropics on Instagram and he also has a fantastic blog at ohiotropics.com. And I wanted to talk to him about a fern he has has that's become rather notorious. Raphael bought this fern at a hardware store about three years ago as a small plant and helpfully the plant label just said something like, hello, my name is Fern. Huh, we've all been there, haven't we? Uh, so he asked the wisdom of the internet and he thinks he's narrowed the fern down to Nephrolepis exaltata fluffy ruffles or Nephrolepis pendula. Now this is one mighty fern. Go and have a look at my show notes where you can see the evidence for yourself. But I wanted to find out from Raphael how he managed to get this fern looking so good and keep it that way. But of course, while size isn't everything, the first question was, just how big is this fern? It's enormous. If I were to stand right next to it, it's probably as, as tall as I am. So I'd probably say maybe from the top to bottom, a good five feet. So I mean, a meter and a half. I know you're from the UK. <laughs> so probably about a meter and a half or five feet or so, something like that. And what is your secret? There must be something. You're obviously doing everything right, Raffaele. But what, what, what are your secrets? Where is this plant situated for you in your home? That fern is actually living in our sunroom. And there are two walls of windows and it's actually sitting right in front of the large northern exposure window. But there's also, so that's the longer window, the longer wall in the sunroom. But there's also a shorter wall of windows that faces east. So it does get, you know, a little bit of direct sunshine. However, it not really much hits the fern. And if anything, it'll just get a little bit of morning sun, which is fine. And actually, now that, <laughs> now that I'm talking, there's also a one skylight. So it, for the most part, gets very bright, indirect sun. It might get a little bit of, of direct morning sun, but not much. So that's number one. And it's it's funny talking to people about ferns because everyone – and I know this is a hot topic of discussion. Everyone thinks that you have to mist the hell out of them. And you know what? I actually, I actually don't mist anything in my house, any house plants. And – I think the key, uh, well, first of all, I should say, really all you're doing is you're you're wetting the leaves. You're not really increasing the humidity when you mist. And I'm not saying it's bad, but it, if you overdo it, certainly it can be bad. I mean, you could be introducing, you know, fungal diseases in the evening, especially. But I don't really, I don't mist anything. I think the most important thing for ferns is being aware of the uh, proper watering and, and the soil moisture. I think that's absolutely the number one thing. You never want to let your fern completely dry out. That's, that's, I think that's how people mostly kill their ferns because they, they do require more attention to the, the soil or potting, uh, potting media moisture. I think if you have proper watering, you don't really have to worry too, too as much, I should say, about the humidity. Although, of course, it is important too, but, but the watering by far is, is the most important thing and making sure that 
you keep it relatively moist and that it doesn't dry out too much. And how do you how often do you water or do, how do you gauge how much water it needs? Is it just a case of sticking your finger in or do you have any more elaborate uh, devices? Yeah. So so in general, you know, I've seen people use, you know, soil moisture meters and all that. I don't really do any of that. Um, I mean, again, I'm not saying it's wrong. Whatever works for you, really. But I, I, I tend to use in most cases, um, I use my finger and, you know, I'll just I'll just test the surface of the soil. And to be honest, you know, I, I preach this on Instagram and and in my watering tips and everything. I, I do that for most plants, but honestly, for this fern and I, some people might be shocked that this is coming out of my mouth. But um, because I, I tell people not to do this, but I, I do water it once a week. And I give it a really good amount of watering, um, a good soaking. And because it's it's gotten so thick that it's hard to even put my finger in the pot without, um, you know, risking breaking anything. Um, so I just make sure to give it a good amount of water about once a week. And I, I can actually tell, you know, you kind of become one with your plants once you've had them for so long. I can tell sometimes if it's too dry because the, the foliage will will look a little bit transparent or lighter green so then i know i have to really you know go go and give it a good watering but but the watering is absolutely critical you know we have all these fancy devices but actually the most sensitive device of all is your finger i I agree (laughs) you know your finger is an incredible an incredibly sensitive uh piece of kit that you can use to actually feel what's going on so that's good to know and what about the potting medium somebody asked me about potting mediums for ferns and i have to say that other than sort of general advice about uh, making sure it's kind of not too dense and, and ha- allows air i didn't really have much to say on that subject do you have any particular potting mediums that you use for ferns i am not for ferns i i am particular about some other some other plants, but re- I mean, honestly, I just use a, just a standard potting, you know, prepackaged houseplant potting mix. Um, I don't think they're, I don't think they're overly, overly sensitive. Um, although I would say, um, you, you know, on that note, if, if your potting media, if it's a soilless mix, you know, that, that is not going to have any nutrition in it. So, I, well, another thing I, I do like to do with most of my plants, really, is I, I do like to fertilize at every watering, but I do it very dilutely, So, uh, except in the winter. So I, I won't fertilize in the winter because, you know, we have very dark winters here, very cloudy, very dark winters where I live, and really nothing grows. So I, I withhold the fertilizer, but... I think any standard potting soil mix should be fine for ferns, but keeping in mind that, you know, there's no nutrition in there. So um, no nutrients. So you'll need, you know, they, they do like to be fertilized as well, especially during the growing season. And I, I prefer fertilizing most of my plants dilutely with every watering. So I think that's key. That's a really interesting point because I think it's feeding is one of those things where one can suddenly think, oh, my gosh, I haven't fed my plants in ages and think that by giving them a big dose that you're doing them a favor. But actually, as you say, a more gradual approach is probably very wise and uh, it isn't going to give the plants too much of a shock. Exactly. And I I think uh, the other reason I like watering every single time or I'm sorry, fertilizing every single time dilutely is because I don't have to remember the last time that I fertilized. And also to your point, to your last point, it won't shock the plant because, you know, especially if you let your plant dry out, if you give it a dose of, you know, full strength fertilizer, it might burn the roots. So, so that, that's another reason why I I like, you know, the dilute, the dilute method. One problem that people often seem to have with ferns is them shedding leaves is this something that you have a problem with? Do you find that you've got, you know, five foot long fern <laughs> fronds coming down or or is it that the, the plant that's kind of happy won't be shedding particularly much? I think that's normal, too. And even my my gigantic nephrolepsis, uh, whatever cultivar it happens to be, um, it you know, every so often some of the lower fronds will will eventually go. And, you know, it's OK with, you know, it's part of it's part of nature. And, you know, you're not you're not doing anything wrong if you see a yellow leaf every so often. 
So, you know, some people freak out when they see a yellow leaf or a frond turning brown. You know, it, as long as it's not a big issue and it's just one or two leaves here and there, it's part of nature. So yellow leaves, you know, not, not, not every plant's going to be picture perfect all the time. It's part of the nature cycle. I highly recommend that you check out Raphael's Instagram account and his website for loads more information about how he grows his plants. And you'll find those links in my show notes at janeperone.com. And it'll also be featuring in our upcoming Orchid episode, so look forward to that. And now it's time for Question of the Week. And the question comes from Jessica. Her Skindapsus pictus argyreus, common name satin pothos, has some marks on the leaves. Jessica's had this plant for about a year and it started to develop yellow and brown dark splotches on a few leaves at a time, even though it's producing new leaves constantly. She says it doesn't seem close enough to the window to get sunburned and she's helpfully sent some photographs. Now, I would always say that as a rule, if less than 10% of your leaves are affected by any kind of marks, then this is generally a sign that it's not something too serious. Obviously, keep an eye. If suddenly all of the leaves are affected in the same way, then you've definitely got a problem. But looking at Jessica's plant, it does look extremely happy. It's not leggy and spindly like some of the satin pothos I've seen. So it's all looking good for this plant. And the damage, which really is brown tips on the leaves, Leaves, I suspect is down to a bit of dryness in the root ball during the growing season combined with a bit of dry air. But as I say, when it's only affecting that small number of leaves, it really isn't something to worry about. And in fact, with this kind of plant, snipping off uh, the odd leaf is not a bad thing because it will encourage the plant to grow more bushy. If you're having problems with a spindly skindapsus, then the best thing to do is just to take some cuttings and root those in water and then add them to the pot or pot them up separately. And that way you'll get more bushiness on your plant. If you're finding that your pothos is not very bushy, then just the process of trimming off some of the stems that are too spindly will promote new growth, which should bush out the plant. You may also need to move it a bit closer to a light source. Oftentimes spindly plants are spindly because they just aren't close enough to the light. This plant likes to be well lit but not in full sun. And do you want to know a really cool fact about satin pothos? Yeah, of course you do. OK, well, I've been reading a book called Nature's Palette, The Science of Plant Colour by David Lee. And he explains why the texture of the satin pothos leaf is so velvety. Well, it's because the epidermal cells that make up the leaf surface are curved, which allows them to refract light into the leaf to get more out of photosynthesis. So in the places where it lives, it doesn't, it's an understory plant, it's not getting a huge amount of light, so it works hard to get extra light by refracting the light it does get via those cells. I found this all very fascinating, but I would love to get David on the show to talk about this in more detail. So that's what I'm trying to do. David Lee, expect an email from me soon. Well, onwards and upwards, I promised you some easy ferns, if that isn't a completely paradoxical statement. And the one that I found that is least likely to die at the slightest dryness around the roots is the mother spleenwort, also known as the hen and chicken's fern, Latin name Asplenium bulbiferum. And in fact, my fern of this particular species came from listener June Saddington. Thank you, June. This is a really great plant. It doesn't wine too much if it dries out a bit. In fact, this very day I went into the front room and realised that mine was looking rather wilty and dry 
Uh, it could very quickly revived uh, after I left it in a tray of water for half an hour. And it isn't like a lot of the ferns, like the maidenhair, where the minute that happens, the whole thing goes brown and crispy. This one just wilts a little bit and then recovers. The foliage is a bit less refined than your maidenhair. It's a bit like the foliage of carrots, if you ever go to the market and buy carrots with the top still on. But I think it's pretty enough and it's been pretty easy for me. So definitely one worth looking out for. If you get fed up with ferns that lose their leaves at the slightest drop of a hat, then the one for you is the Japanese holly fern, Curtonium falcatum. It's often grown as an outdoor plant, this one, but actually it grows pretty well indoors. And it's got leathery, glossy leaves, which means that it's not that bothered by the things that ferns are usually bothered by, which is dry air. Another great fern for us fern killers is the lemon button fern, Nephrolepis cordifolia. It is a relative of the Boston fern, which is far trickier, but this one's a lot smaller. It's not going to grow as big as your Boston fern. And it's really quite a shade tolerant plant. You can stick it in a dark corner and it won't cause much of a problem for you. It's small too, so if you've got narrow windowsills or you want to stick a fern under a glass cloche or put it in a terrarium, this is a really good choice. And one fern that seems absolutely ubiquitous these days, the blue star fern, Latin name Flebodium aureum, is very common in almost every supermarket you go into these days. It's often sold without uh, any indication of what it is, but its grey blue leaves usually give it away. So this epiphyte is quite tolerant to being treated to the occasional dry spell. It doesn't like to sit in water. So just make sure that you're a little bit careful. You treat it more like an epiphyte than you would a regular fern. And if you're repotting, you can even add a bit of bark to the compost, which helps in enormously. And if you're looking at your smartphone right now and cursing because you've actually killed all of those ferns, then there's one final option to try. And it's a bit of a cheat because strictly speaking, they're not actually ferns, but asparagus ferns are a great choice for those of us who struggle with real ferns. They're all related to the asparagus that we buy in the supermarket. Please don't try eating them though. These are not the ones that you want to be sautéing with some anchovies, I promise you. So what are the types of asparagus ferns that you can grow? Well, there's generally four types that you'll find. And they all look a bit different, but need roughly the same care. They've got the feathery foliage that we like of the fern, but, but they're incredibly tolerant of watering lapses, which is good news for all of us. My favourite is probably Asparagus densiflorus myosi, which is the plume asparagus or the foxtail fern, which, as the name suggests, it has these amazing plumes of leaves that look like a fox's tail. They're very beautiful, great in a hanging basket. And quite dramatic when they get really big. The sickle thaw is Asparagus falcatus, and this has got sickle shaped little leaves. This is probably my least favourite of the four. It's a bit boring, really, but it's not a bad plant. It's just not setting the world on fire for me. Then there is Asparagus cetaceus, the common asparagus fern, which is often used by florists for its foliage. And it's so common and so easy to get hold of, it's definitely worth getting your hands on because it will grow up into quite a beautiful plant. And finally, there's Asparagus densiflorus sprengeri group, which has arching branches of needle-like leaves and it's very beautiful too. Now, just be careful with these because occasionally they produce these very sharp thorny bits, which uh, will really do you some damage if you're fiddling about with your plant unaware. So do watch out for that. But other than that, they're fairly tolerant houseplants. They need indirect light, uh, you know, humidity, reasonable an annual repot and you should be doing all right with this plant there isn't much more to say about it other than they do respond well to a bit of pruning so if yours gets out of hand then don't be too shy to cut it back just wear some gloves remember it does have thorns if you're really searching for that maiden hair look there is one option which i'll offer to you and regular listeners to the show will remember when i got this plant it's called diddy mclana trunk oh man Let's try again. I need to get Hesse on by my side for this one. Diddy McLeaner truncatula. It's also known as the cloak fern or the mahogany maidenhair fern. I'm not going to say it's super easy. Mine does go crispy if it isn't regularly watered, but it definitely is easier than the maidenhair. So this one is definitely worth a look if you are a maidenhair fan and just depressed by how much you're spending on what turn out to be dead plants.
Follow all the tips at the beginning of the show and hopefully you'll be able to keep yours looking reasonably good. It does crisp up from time to time. Just remove those crisped leaves and continue on. we've merely scratched the surface of the fern world in this episode and i know we haven't even talked about staghorn ferns at all i think we need to devote a whole episode to those because they're just such a wonderful group of plants so that'll come in a later edition but for now i hope that's given you some inspiration to try again with ferns as always i'd love to hear from you if you're a fernatic a fern killer or a fern agnostic let's be having you let's hear all your fern stories fern pictures and half dead house plants jane.perone is the place to go for all the links connected with the show you'll also find me on twitter as at jane perone and instagram j.l.perone and come and join us on facebook Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge is growing by the day and I've just appointed two new moderators to help the group run smoothly. So thank you to Nathan and Amy for stepping up. And I'll finish by bringing you a quote from the late great gardener Christopher Lloyd who said, The great thing is not to be timid in your gardening, whether it's colours, shapes, juxtapositions or the contents themselves. Splash around and enjoy yourself. That's certainly a sentiment I'll be taking on this week. Have a great gardening week, guys. See you soon. Bye. music you heard in this week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, Plantation by Jason Shaw and O oh Mallory by Josh Woodward, all licensed under Creative Commons. See janeperone.com for details. <laughs>